I suspect we are competing with a rather popular group downstairs, what these folks don't realize, because it takes oil to grease all the wheels. <coughs> if you look at the recent issue of Time magazine, you would have, back in the economics section, have discovered a simple graph that shows the present, past, and projected oil consumption for the United States. The per capita consumption in 1970 amounted to 1,109 gallons per person. By 1985, this consumption is estimated to go up to 1,760 gallons per person. And a similar picture would obtain if we looked at statistics and projections for other countries around the world. At the same time, we have been made painfully aware of the fact particularly this last summer and again this fall, that oil is not available, at least doesn't appear to be available, in sufficient quantities to meet present demands, let alone projected ones. We know in, that in the absence of adequate domestic oil reservoirs, American oil companies and those from other nations as well, for years have had to turn to the vast oil pools of the Persian Gulf countries and other areas of the Middle East and North Africa. And for the most part, the development, the exploration and exploitation of this process and in this area of the world went on without causing too much fuss and stir until some of the countries in the area began to discover oil as a political weapon making Americans and other oil-dependent nations even more aware of the oil crisis and potential national shortages. Our speaker for this evening, Mr. Richard H. Imus, will deal with the Persian Gulf as the center of the world's oil reserves. He has intimate knowledge of the Persian Gulf nations, where he represented the United States Department of State as an economic and commercial petroleum officer in Saudi Arabia in 1970 and 1971, and as a regional economic and commercial officer for the five countries of the Persian Gulf. In this latter capacity, he was stationed in Kuwait beginning in 1972. Mr. Imus entered the Foreign Service in 1962 after schooling at Stanford, Berkeley, and the University of Vienna. Mr. Imus speaks Arabic, German, French. At present, he is assigned as a deputy examiner in the Board of Examiners of the Foreign Service. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Richard Imes. Thank you. As pleased as I am uh, to be here to talk to you, uh, I also thought that uh, lecture downstairs looked uh, awfully interesting. We'll see. Normally, I would uh, begin. Uh, uh, talk of this nature uh, before a group uh, of Americans by saying that the Persian Gulf uh, or Arabian Gulf, depending on which side of the Gulf you happen to be standing on when you're talking, um, here in the United States, Persian Gulf, is an area unknown to people, uh, is an area of uh, a new area in our in our own uh, uh, thoughts and our own relationship. Uh, I will say that for some of you here tonight. Uh, however, in walking in through the door tonight, uh, I heard I thought I heard some Farsi being spoken there in the back row. So therefore, these uh, these comments may not be uh, may not be so so applicable because we may have some gentlemen here who uh, may know more about the Persian Gulf. Uh, may have forgotten more about the Persian Gulf than I know. I hope if uh, they find that uh, I get out of line uh, or that I make a mistake that they'll correct me or if they find they agree with me, let me know and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, for the benefit of those of you who have uh, <coughs> not traveled in such uh, well-traveled and well-known uh, uh, cities and states such as Hajman and Umbil Gaiwain, or who have not uh, visited cities, uh, again, very well-known cities such as uh, Khuramshar or uh, Bandashapur, 
on the other side of the Gulf, I might sketch very briefly uh, what we mean when we talk about the, the Persian Gulf. The area, uh, as you know, sets off one side of the Arabian Peninsula and divides, uh, divides it from uh, the country of Iran. The area is basically very arid, and uh, if you had lived there as I have, you will find it's uh, extremely hot. It uh, at times can be unbelievably hot. We have some uh, Bureau of Public Roads people in Kuwait advising the Kuwaitis on the construction of highways. They tell me that the surface road temperature in Kuwait can, in the middle of the summer, right on the road, uh, reach as high as 160 degrees, which is unbelievable. Uh, I, myself, standing on the dock at Ras Tanura in Saudi Arabia, the big Aramco oil terminal, glanced casually over my shoulder at the thermometer and gasped when I saw it at 131 degrees. It's the hottest I've seen. At any rate, it's a warm, warm hot, arid area that is devoid of most natural resources. Before the, except oil, before the advent of petroleum, uh, the people in the Gulf area primarily were confined to small scale trading and shipping. A uh, certain amount of uh, Bedouins moved up and down both sides of the Gulf and pearls. This area was the uh, center of the world's pearling industry for many, many years until the development of cultured pearls in Japan put these people out of business. So you'll find even today in places like the state of Bahrain, the importation of a Japanese cultural per cultured pearl is forbidden. Well, you can't make a great deal of a living off of pearls and minor trade. And so for many, many years, this area languished. It, uh, on the Arab side of the Gulf, and you'll excuse me if many of my comments are directed toward the Arab side of the Gulf, that's the, the area that I've lived in. I've visited Iran on numerous occasions, but uh, uh, I have not lived there. So a number of my examples, most of my examples will be drawn from the Arab side. Uh, in any case, this area was uh, many ways a fringe area in Iran. It was a fringe area, certainly, in the Arab world. Uh, it kind of slumbered along in the back, uh, backwaters of history until the early part of the 19th century when some of the states along the Arab Gulf took to uh, attacking ships that were plying to and from the British uh, possessions uh, in India. Like so many things in history, so many things in this world, uh, as to whether these people were pirates or patriots depends on which history book you read. Uh, British history books will say they were pirates. In any case, whatever their motivation was, uh, whether it was to keep the foreigner out of their trading waters or whether it was just loot, uh, they attacked these ships and brought the British into the area. The British fleet, British Marines came into the area in the early part of the 19th century, the 1830s, and landed in these sheikdoms, burned the local forts, forced the local sheikhs, the local rulers, to conclude treaties uh, with the British. That is why, until very recently, some of the states in the area were called the Trucial States. The British, British influence in the Gulf dates from this area, uh, from this era in 1830. British influence extended up both sides of the Gulf, both on the Arab side and on the Iranian side. On the Arab side, it was more obvious. On the Iranian side, it was disguised a little more. But certainly in the 19th century, the end result was the same. Great Britain called the shots in the Gulf and Great Britain alone. British power in the Gulf began to recede slowly. The Iranians were, a little, were more successful than the Arabs in prying the British loose. But eventually, in uh, 1972, the British withdrew finally from the Gulf uh, as the result of a decision of the Labour government that policy of British involvement east of Suez was simply too expensive and was not worth the returns uh, uh, for the British government. In the meanwhile, while the British were there, the area had developed into a rich oil producer. Oil production uh, began, first of all, uh, of course, in Iran at the early, uh, in the early years of this, uh, of this century. Uh, on the Arab side, the first state to have oil was the little uh, island of Bahrain. 
uh, which unfortunately was never able to develop massive oil production. It still has oil, but it's a very, it's a very modest amount. The big oil producing countries uh, in the middle, uh, in the uh, Persian Gulf, however, are the countries of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, both of which effectively came, as oil people like to say, on stream after the Second World War. The um, region itself has a mammoth oil production. It produces yearly about 22 and a half million barrels a day. Now, million barrels or barrels a day is an, just an accounting term, really, uh, that you use in the oil industry that oil people like to, to use. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's some guy down on the port at Rastanur filling up a, a barrel of oil and tossing it onto a ship and saying, you know, that's one, that's two, that's 4,666, 4,667. A million barrels a day is, is just simply just think of it as an accounting term. 22 and a half million barrels a day. This is more than the U.S. and the USSR combined produce. And the U.S. and the USSR are themselves the biggest oil producers in the, uh, in the world. So you can see that this area is where the, where the oil is. This means, of course, that the area has tremendous wealth. Uh, tremendous amounts of money are coming in. Uh, in the state of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, uh, about uh, to this, uh, this year, about $3 billion for 3.5 million people. Much of this, or almost all of this money, is now being spent on development. Now, the countries in the Persian Gulf vary. On the Arab side of the Gulf, you have a thin population. You don't have too many people, and you have a very low skill level. In Iran, you have a much higher skill level, and you have much greater uh, development needs because the country is much bigger, and the needs of the people are much bigger. Now, this becomes uh, of uh, importance later when we talk with what, uh, what these countries do with their money. Uh, the Persian Gulf represents for us as Americans a market uh, for our goods and services, uh, things we can sell to these people so we can have money later to buy their oil. It runs into the millions and millions. There's a little country out in the Persian Gulf that most of you probably never heard of. I certainly hadn't until, until I went out there, uh, called Abu Dhabi. Uh, this country of Abu Dhabi. Well, it's now a constituent state of a, of a federation, Union of Arab Emirates. It's estimated, we told Congress recently in a request to beef up our embassy there, tiny embassy, five guys is all, that the market for U.S. goods and services in this country that 99.99% of the American businessmen have never heard of, they don't, they don't even know whether it's a country, uh, a new type of teenage dance, or a type of fruit that this country of Abu Dhabi represents a market of $90 million this year. That's a lot of cash for Americans to bring in if they can get it. So this illustrates that the country, that this area in the Persian Gulf is a very, very wealthy area. Lots of money out here from, from oil. The area could also be a source of investment funds uh, in various, various parts of the world. I think we'll see it's a source of investment funds for the United States. I think you'll see more and more Arab investment in the United States. Uh, already, countries like, uh, like Kuwait are beginning to look at the possibility of investing here. The Kuwaitis, for example, already have invested substantial amounts of money in Europe. Uh, Kuwaiti interests own a very large percentage of the Champs-Élysées in Paris, for example. Saudi Arabia, for example, is one of the Arab countries, will have perhaps as high as $20 billion in 1985 for investment overseas. Iran, on the other hand, because of its own internal development needs, will virtually use most of its oil revenue inside the country for either one, development, or two, the building up of a huge military machine, which the present uh, uh, government of the, of the Shah, or to call him for the Shah and Shah area mayor, wants or feels that he needs to have in order to secure Iran's position in the world. So when we talk about uh, the amount of money that could flow outside of the region to here in the United States or Europe or wherever. Uh, we're really talking about Arab money rather than uh, uh, the money for the region or Arab and Iranian money. Another example of how uh, we can find Arab funds at work here in the United States was a man who came out to see us in Kuwait from Idaho. He had a great, uh, he had an idea where you feed cattle on potatoes. Uh, nobody uh, in this country was very interested in the idea. He couldn't get any funding for it at all. I don't know how in the world he ever heard of Kuwait, or why in the world he ever came out to Kuwait, but he did. He talked to some Kuwaitis that sounded interesting. They bankrolled him, 
and uh, the venture was successful, and both he and the Kuwaitis have done very nicely by it indeed. One of the big uh, developments you're going to see is more and more, uh, I think, more and more uh, Middle East investment in our downstream oil facilities. We already have a, by downstream, that's a, it's another oil company, uh, uh, oil phrase, it means the, that portion of the oil business that deals with uh, the distribution, deals directly with the consumers. So the down, downstream facilities would be refining and distribution in contrast to the actual drilling and shipping of the oil in the producing country, which is upstream. Well, we're going to see more Arabs, uh, uh, more Arab money here. We're going to see Iranian money here. The government of Iran has already concluded a deal with the Ashland Oil Company of the United States where Ashland will be given access to certain Iranian crude oil, and in return, the government of Iran will own part of Ashland here in the United States. So it may be when you drive down to tank up your car, you tank it up at the ABC gas station, and you don't know, but the silent partner or the majority partner in the ABC gas station is King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, or the Sheikh of uh, Abu Dhabi, or the Emir of Kuwait. There's some uh, problems that these countries have, uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, leave Iran out for the moment and talk basically. Uh, Iran is, is, is an underdeveloped country. Let me talk briefly about Iran. Iran is an underdeveloped country, but uh, is a country that is already f experiencing a phenomenal growth rate. Uh, it's, uh, it's doing very well indeed. It still has many, many problems, many social problems, many economic problems, which I uh, am not as intimately familiar with as I am about the Arab side. But it is generally in a much better position. It's much further developed than the countries on the Arabian side of the Gulf. The countries on the Arabian side of the Gulf are basically characterized by a low population. There just aren't very many people. Let me give you an example. Let's go back to that sounds like the mythical land of Abu Dhabi, except there really isn't Abu Dhabi. Here's a country that's a major oil producer, producing about one and a half million barrels of oil a day. It's nothing like Saudi Arabia, but it's still substantial. We'll be going up. There are perhaps in Abu Dhabi, as somewhere in the neighborhood, it's hard to say because uh, uh, there's some debate about the census, but of native Abu Dhabians, there may be anywhere 25, 30, maybe there's 50,000 Abu Dhabians, and then there's a larger, much larger number, of course, of other peoples that have come to share the wealth. Some people would say that the number of Abu Dhabians is, is, uh, is only about uh, 25,000. In any case, let's, let's, let's take a wide guess. Let's say there are 50,000 Abu Dhabians. These people may soon have an annual oil income in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Now, this is what I mean in terms of a thin population versus tremendous wealth. The country of Saudi Arabia that's about to become the world's largest producer of crude oil, that possesses the world's vastest reserves of crude oil, has a population ranging somewhere probably between three and a half and five and a half million people, depending on, again, whose figures you take. There's never been a census. I would tend to argue for three and a half million people. I believe officially the government of Saudi Arabia claims in the neighborhood of five million people. But in any case, uh, there are – the number of people in uh, Saudi Arabia is much smaller than you would think for a country with such unbelievably large amounts of financial power and, finan and the finan their financial reserves. The importance uh, – this area is clearly uh, uh, because of oil, the importance to us of oil. There's a growing dependence on this oil all over the, all over the world. Uh, our friends in Europe are about 77 percent dependent on Middle Eastern oil for their energy requirements. You see it's vital to them. Japan does a little better because they have access to oil in Indonesia, but still they get 41 percent of their energy requirements from the countries of the Middle East. And by that I mean essentially the Persian – the countries on the Persian Gulf and, and my figures would also include uh, Libya. The United States is in a little better position. We only import about 15 percent of our total crude oil requirements from the Middle East. But of that 15 percent, 5 percent – of 15 percent, we only import 15 percent, and of that 15 percent, 5 percent comes from the Middle East. Well, where's the other 10 percent come, you ask? Basically, from our traditional suppliers in this hemisphere, countries like Venezuela, countries like Canada. One of the problems is, though, however, that the supply of oil, both in the United States and with our traditional suppliers in this hemisphere, is plateauing out and will either eventually decline 
or will become more expensive to produce, and perhaps become so expensive to produce it's not really economical, which means that we have to look elsewhere for, our, for, for the oil. And the most economical oil you will find is in the Middle East. In terms of reserves, what country can produce the oil the cheapest and what country will be producing it the longest, you eventually land on the country of Saudi Arabia. Iran has substantial quantities of oil. It has, uh, it's, uh, for many years, it was always neck and neck with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is now producing more. Iran will also increase. But Saudi Arabia will be pumping oil long after supplies are exhausted in Iran. I don't have reserve figures right here with me, uh, but there is absolutely no doubt that Saudi Arabia's reserves are greatly in excess of, uh, of Iran's. Uh, it's just not a question either of the amount of oil, it's the, it's the uh, difficulty of getting at it. For example, we have a lot of oil off the eastern shore here in the United States, but uh, it's on the continental shelf and it's hard to get at, it's expensive to get at. There's lots of oil, additional oil in Venezuela, but it's hard to get at. Its cost per barrel is going to be expensive. You also have the question of whether that oil or the acquisition of that oil or the using of that oil is going to mesh with your environmental considerations. Drilling oil wells off the east coast of the United States is uh, creating a real environmental debate with the people in the urban corridor between Washington, D.C. and Boston who want be sure that their beaches, their recreation areas, are not spoiled by oil spillage, such as happened in the Santa Barbara Channel a few years ago. Other problems might be that oil from Venezuela has a high sulfur content, so it's either very expensive to try and get that sulfur out, or if you burn that oil, you create real pollution problems. So from an economic point of view, the Middle East is our obvious source of oil. We're going to have to turn to the Middle East Demand for oil is rising tremendously. In the case of Saudi Arabia, when I first went there in 1970, they were just inching up to 3 million barrels of oil a day. That had taken them really essentially since the end of the Second World War. That's in 1970. Now, 1970 wasn't really a base year for energy consumption. We weren't driving around in uh, horses and buggies. Uh, we weren't uh, lighting our homes with uh, candles. We were using a lot of energy in 1970. Well, that 3 million barrels a day figure in Saudi Arabia in 1970 has jumped to today, 1973, in three years to 8.5 million barrels a day. The increase this year from last year is up 60%. Now, these companies would not, the oil companies would not be pumping that oil unless they could sell it. So this is some indication of the increasing expansion of the market, up 60% from last year. Saudi Arabia, as I said, is, is a natural source for oil. Some people say they're going to be producing as high as 20 million barrels a day in 1980. That's roughly the total output of the entire Persian Gulf today. If Saudi Arabia does produce that, that amount of oil, and it's, it's open to question whether they, whether they will, they'll be f far and away the world's biggest oil producer and probably among the world's wealthiest nations and certainly the world's wealthiest nation in terms of per capita income. Other countries in the area also produce substantial amounts of oil, such as Kuwait, as I said, three million barrels, and, uh, and Abu Dhabi, which is now over, over a million barrels. Uh, Iran is also moving up fast and will soon be in the Saudi Arabian class, but because of the nature of the reserves, most people think they're going to peak out sooner than the uh, Saudis will. Well, one of the questions that's raised, of course, is if we're becoming, over, if we're becoming more and more dependent on this oil, what's this going to do to our policy in the Middle East? I don't have time to go into the tangled threads of our policy and our problems in the Middle East. Um, it's a very, it's a very ticky and, uh, sticky and complicated problem. But suffice it to say that our policy in the Middle East since 1948 has been based essentially on support of the state of Israel. Uh, to the Arab states, the state of Israel represents an intrusion of an alien people in an area that they consider their homeland. They therefore regard the Israelis as their enemy. And when we aid the Israelis, they tend to regard us as their enemy. They feel that they have some real bones to pick with us. They feel that uh, uh, our policy in the Middle East has not been even-handed, has not been just, has not been fair. 
So there is a tendency then for the Arabs to say, who up until now have really not had any way to exert pressure on us, to say, kind of like twisting our arms, they keep pushing it up, and when it starts to hurt, then they say, let's talk about uh, your policy toward Israel. This is beginning to worry some people. The president has already commented on it. He said officially, we will not change our commitment to Israel. We will not alter our support of the state of Israel because of our need for Arab oil. What happens when that 5% figure of dependence on Middle Eastern oil rises to 25 or 30% is, of course, another question and is a very interesting question that a lot of people are starting to ask about. But, our, but as, of the mo as of the moment, our government says we will, not change, uh, we will not change our policy in the least. People say, well, maybe the Arabs will just cut off that oil. Maybe they'll turn it off, uh, possibly. That was uh, some of that in 1967 when we were accused of helping the Israelis uh, in the uh, war against uh, uh, the Arabs. But I think it's more likely that the answer will be a little more sophisticated. Iran, as we said, needs all the money it can get. There's a lot of things on the Shah's plate right now, and he needs the money for them. So I'll, they've got to keep production as high as they can. Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, is a country of, say, three and a half, four or five million people, something like that with this tremendous amount of money coming in, about $3 billion this year. It's an underdeveloped country. All of these countries have what you call an absorptive capacity. You can just spend so much money. It's kind of like if the U.S. government said, we're going to build the biggest military base ever built in the world, and we're going to build it here in Ames, Iowa. And you people in Ames, you're going to completely build it yourself. Nobody's going to help you. You couldn't do it. The task would be beyond you. You'd have to bring in somebody from the outside. The town of Ames just simply isn't big enough to provide the variety of skilled manpower that would be necessary to complete that type of project. That's the problem in countries like Kuwait, in countries like Saudi Arabia. The government does not have sufficient number of trained technocrats to carry out the development project at a level, the same level, that the income is coming in. So there's a surplus, in other words. They can only spend X amount of this. They can only spend 60% of it or whatever it is. So they've got to do something with the rest of the money. What are they going to do? Well, you can put it in the bank. That's a good idea. We can invest it in some type of securities. That's not a bad idea. But these, we can invest it in property. But if we put it in the bank, we invest it in securities. Those securities have to be in some type of a currency put it in the bank, it's got to be in some type of currency. A country like Saudi Arabia is getting paid in dollars. We all know what's happened to the dollar over the last couple of years. It just slid slowly down. So the Saudi will tell you, well, if I put this in dollars, I'm going to lose. So maybe I ought to put it in something else. Well, what can he put it in? He put it in pounds sterling? Well, we all know what's happened to the pound, too. He tries to put it in yen. He tries to put it in daymark. There just aren't enough yen around. There aren't enough daymark around. Those countries' economies aren't big enough to generate currency in the three, four, five, ten, twenty billion dollar range for one country like Saudi Arabia to get. So this is a real problem. So they look around for something. Well, what's constant? What's not going down? There must be something that's not going down and it's going up. Yeah, that's pretty obvious too. That's oil. So. Uh, the state of Kuwait says, this makes sense. This argument uh, has some validity. So they tell uh, British Petroleum and, and uh, Gulf Oil, who own the concession out there, no, three million barrels a day is just nice for us, thanks. You hold production at this level. And BP and Gulf said, well, we had all sorts of expansion plans, and we wanted to push uh, uh, your production up to five million barrels because we think we can sell this. The government of Kuwait says, well, that's, you know, that's nice for you, but it's, uh, it's our oil, so you hold it at three million barrels. And that's exactly what's happened in Kuwait. So the Saudis, for example, say, well, if, if producing this extra oil is going to generate all this money, we're going to have these dollars coming in, and holding all of these dollars creates a problem for us, we're kind of leaning over one way to help you as Americans. We don't need to produce this kind of oil. It's not a question of cutting off the oil. It's just a question. They don't need to produce it in the quantities that we need it. So they say, if we're going to be forthcoming and take on these problems of where to invest this and what we do with it, we expect you to be a little more forthcoming. 
uh, in terms of your policy in the Middle East. Uh, we'd like to see a little more, what we feel would be a little more even-handedness in the Middle East. And that's kind of the gist of what King Faisal has been saying lately to our ambassador in Jeddah and what he's also been saying publicly, that they would like to see a little more give, a little more flexibility on our policy in order that they raise their production to suit our needs. So you see, it's not a question of turning it on or turning it off. There's also a question of the level of production and the amount of oil that they sell to us. Of course, if they did turn it off, they would have all sorts of problems. But we would also have all sorts of problems. And probably on balance, the Arab countries are in a better position for a standoff on a complete cutoff than we are. These countries are, as I say, underdeveloped. They have vast financial reserves. And the amounts of money that they have already in the bank are so great that they can pay for their imports. That's really what you're talking about. If they cut off the oil, no more money's coming in. It's kind of like what happens if you lose your job. You go then to your bank account, and everything's fine until the bank account shrinks down. In the case of these Arab countries, the import bill for things that they really have to import, I mean, they can cut out a lot of things, is not that great. And so, in other words, their bank account is going to last a long time. In countries like or in Western Europe that depend 77% for their energy requirements on the Arab or Middle Eastern oil, uh, just turning off that oil for six months could really raise havoc with their economy. You, there are plans in the OECD to store oil, but you can just store so much oil, and particularly when we're now consuming it in the vast quantities that we are. And it costs money to store oil. It's not cheap. It's a real problem. So that even in a cutoff, these countries are in very good shape, but as I said before, they don't necessarily have to, have to cut it off. So the Arabs have this option of, of regulating the supply of oil to perhaps get us to be a little more forthcoming in the Middle East. What else can they do? Well, they could uh, put the squeeze on us uh, uh, by saying the American company's out. I mean, American companies don't necessarily have to pump this oil. They're making profits out there pumping this oil. There's lots of other companies that could pump it. There's no reason, for example, why you could, theoretically, you could not replace an American company in Saudi Arabia with a French company in Saudi Arabia, and that French company would uh, manage the oil fields, and eventually the, that same oil would be sold to an American company for distribution in the United States. So we could be got at in terms of our economic interests out there in this way. Some people also say, and this is kind of way out, that the Arabs can can use their funds to raise havoc in the stock market. They, uh, they can uh, dump dollars in Europe in great quantities. They can buy stocks and fiddle the stock market and so forth. Uh, theoretically, I suppose that any country that uh, is getting $20 billion a year, uh, as the Saudis may get by 1985, can do this. But the oil in the Arab countries is only of value if they can exchange it for uh, currency, that they can buy the things that they want. Also, with these tremendous funds, they've got to invest them someplace. And it's not in their interest to completely destroy the world financial system or to destroy the currency that is most widely used in the world. Uh, if you talk to any finance minister in any of the Arab countries, this is what he'll tell you. He'll say that it's in our interest that we have a stable dollar, particularly since so much of our oil income is coming in in dollars. That's a, so fiddling with the... Uh, uh, what we might call economic warfare or currency warfare is, uh, is a possibility, but I don't think uh, terribly likely. Let me wrap up and then we can have some questions with one real, real point. What's the issue here? Uh, is the issue our policy in Israel? Is the issue uh, uh, Arab, Arab oil? I think the real issue that we have to address ourselves to in the energy crisis is whether or not the United States and the American people can afford both politically, strategically, and economically to become vitally dependent on another foreign country. Now, whether that country be Arab or whether that country be uh, Colombian or whether that country be Australia or wherever, whether the United States can afford to let this happen. I said politically. We covered that, I think, how a 
country in the Middle East providing oil could use oil as a weapon to get us to do things politically, that is, in the case of the Arab-Israeli dispute, to, say, withdraw our support from the state of Israel or to modulate it or to put pressure on Israel. That's a political cost. Uh, strategically, I mean, it's quite clear. Um, we might be in a war that uh, a foreign country uh, disapproved of, or we might be doing something. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Navy out in Vietnam, they picked up their, their oil in the, in the Sheikh of Bahrain in the Persian Gulf. Someone could say, well, I don't approve of your actions out there in Vietnam. I think this is aggression and fascism and so forth. We just turn off the oil. When the oil turns off, uh, our military machine stops. I said there are certain economic problems. Well, they sure are. We've got to pay for this stuff some way. And uh, the Arabs uh, and the Iranians aren't giving it away this year. In 1970, Stanford Research Center out in Palo Alto, in California, said we imported about $3 billion worth of petroleum products. The same study says that in 1985, using constant dollars, it's an accounting term economists use to take care of inflation, that $3 billion figure may rise to $30 billion. That's a big increase. $3 billion is a lot of money, too. And you might say, my word, that's, that's fantastic in 1970. The only thing was, in 1970, we were uh, exporting about $42 billion worth of goods and services. So we really didn't have much of a problem paying for that $3 billion worth of oil imports from our $42 billion that we earned through goods and services. Well, you say, uh, what, are we, uh, what are we selling? Well, primarily, we're selling high-technology products such as uh, aircraft, computers. That's kind of number two. But number one is the agricultural products produced in states like Iowa and the other agricultural areas of the United States. You may find a situation where, the, in the future, the farmer of Iowa decides how fast the citizen of the state of Florida is going to be able to tool along the highway because his ability to raise and sell things like soybeans and sorghum and grain and so forth is going to decide how much money we have to buy oil from countries like Iran, and Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Libya, wherever. So you might say, well, then we'll, we, this 42 million, let's just push that up. We'll, we'll increase that. The only trouble is that hasn't been going up because at the same time we've been buying or our energy requirements have gone up. People have developed an interest in such things as Toyota cars, Akai tape recorders, nice cut crystal from Germany. So our import have also been rising. And for the first time in our history in recent years, we have experienced a negative balance of trade. At one stage in 1972, our balance of payments is distinct from our, that's the whole account is distinct from, distinct from the balance of trade, which is just part of the account, uh, was $6.2 billion in the red. That's improved slightly since then, but it's not a question really of our expanding our balance of payment surplus tremendously. It's a question of just trying to get out of the hole trying to get from the red side of the ledger over onto the black side of the ledger. So if we're going to import $30 billion worth of crude oil in 1985, we may have a real problem trying to pay for it. And it may be that it is in better, it may be in the interest of our economy to develop alternative sources of energy that are available domestically, that are paid for domestically, rather than to depend on external sources of energy that have to be paid for with foreign exchange at such a level that our economy finds it virtually impossible to develop that foreign exchange. Uh, I have great confidence in the, in the ability of uh, our businesses, of our farmers, uh, to push up our balance of, uh, of payments surplus. But the question is, and it's a very open question, and we may not have this problem, but it's a question that has to be raised. Will we, if our energy requirements expand so tremendously, will we be able to pay for this, this oil uh, when this time comes. Now, there are other ways that, you know, we can get the money. You, one of the ways, for example, I don't want to go into it in great detail. I've talked far too long, and I want to hear what, what your questions are, what you're interested in hearing about. One way, for example, would be to encourage Arab countries who are getting paid this money to reinvest the money back in the United States. One very obvious partnership is, uh, is a downstream, is back down to the uh, downstream oil operations, so that the government of Saudi Arabia might take some of the money that it's getting, from the oil companies in Saudi Arabia and might reinvest that money back in the United States. We're already seeing a trend toward that, and we in the United States government and the State Department are trying to uh, encourage it. So on balance, 
It may be that we have to develop our own energy sources here in the United States, such things as we may have to look for oil and shale, where we have vast oil reserves, but that oil is going to be very expensive. And if we do that, the American people are going to have to probably do without other things. The cost is tremendous, uh, far, far greater than the cost of Middle Eastern oil. Uh, it may be that uh, uh, we have to invest additional funds so that the development of nuclear energy moves along a little faster. The clean reactor, the breeder reactor come uh, not within this century, but within this decade. These are all going to be hard bullets to bite. These are all going to be very difficult decisions that are going to have to be made at the highest level of our government, probably only by the president. But what this means is that whatever decision is made in the coming decade, you and I are going to hear more and more about obscure little countries, obscure up until this time, as Abu Dhabi. We're going to have more and more to do with the Middle East, and the Middle East is going to become more and more important in our everyday lives. That's a fact, and that's a fact that we're going to have to adjust to and live with. Anybody have any questions? And maybe we can discuss the situation uh, between us. Yes? I'm afraid that you're counting too much on the Iowa farmer. I think you can deplete our soil just as well as you are our oil reserves. That may be. Then we really have a problem because it's, it's interesting, um, sometimes ask people why the Treasury was so upset when President Nixon put an embargo on soybeans. One of the reasons was because if we can't sell soybeans, we can't earn dollars. If we can't earn dollars, people get nervous about the dollar. It means there's going to be pressure on the dollar. It means the Treasury is going to have all sorts of exchange problems. This, is, uh, this whole energy crisis then gets into a whole question of economic trade-offs. You mentioned whether the Iowa farmer is going to be able to make it. Remember a while back, everybody said those farmers, I remember on the East Coast, people said those farmers out in Iowa, they're just gouging us. They're getting these tremendous uh, prices for things. And the reason these Iowa farmers, they're getting too much money for these soybeans. That's what's wrong. They've raised the price up. Someone said, well, no, it's not the Iowa farmers. It's all these, these, these foreigners. They're the ones who are doing it. You know, It's always nice to look over your border and blame the foreigner. Uh, it's a simple solution. So people put on pressure. People say, well, what do we care whether the Japanese have soybeans for soy sauce? What do we care whether the uh, Europeans have, uh, have soybeans? So let's, uh, let's stop this. Let's, uh, if, this is, uh, if this is the demand and this is the supply, let's cut the demand. The supply will remain constant and the prices will go down and feed won't cost so much for, for the cattle and our meat prices will go down. And so in very sim simple terms, the president put an embargo on the export of soybeans. The only trouble, soybeans earns this much foreign exchange. So that's this much less foreign exchange, this much less dollars that we have to take over here and pay the Arabs for oil. So to carry the thing to an absurd and, and perhaps unrealistic extreme, you could have a situation where the price of meat in the supermarket was acceptable. but you were unable to get to the supermarket to buy it because your gas station was out of gas this week. I mean, this shows the type of trade-off in the United States that we're going to have to be thinking about in the next decade. Before, we had so many resources, you just kind of grabbed everything. But now we're getting into more of a situation where is it going to be this or is it going to be this? Are we going to import less oil and instead burn soft coal, of which we have a lot, and cut our pollution standards? and go back to lousy, crummy, polluted air that we had in the 19th century or, or that cities like St. Louis had in the 1920s? These are the trade-offs. These are the decisions that people are going to have to make. I doubt it, just like I doubt that, that opening the, the building, the Alaska pipeline, will solve the problem, would tend to mitigate it. But the entire lifestyle that has been developed in the United States, as the figures that Mr. Frederick read to you out of Time magazine indicate, uh, are so heavily based on a high consumption of energy 
that to drop our consumption of energy sufficiently to really affect our dependence on overseas oil, particularly in the future, becomes so politically unpalatable. It becomes so difficult. How are you going to make the man who moves from a shack into a $40,000 house or from a $20,000 house into a $40,000 house move back into the $20,000 house? It's a very difficult thing to get people to do. Now, you can, you can use this as a factor. There's all sorts of things. You can maybe, maybe you're going to uh, put together a combination to lessen your dependence on overseas oil. You're going to say, we're going to spend more money on the development of alternative energy sources while at the same time restricting the use of fossil, of, of uh, petroleum products, and we're going to compromise on uh, pollution control and use more coal. There's, there's a number of, of building blocks you, you can put together in this thing. You can do things like put a graduated tax on cars, like you said. You can do, uh, you could theoretically, I don't think this has even been contemplated, you could raise electricity rates uh, at homes, for example, to the point where it became economically possible only to use electricity for very necessary things such as light and heat so that if you brushed your teeth with an electric toothbrush, it would be a $10 and a half cleaning job. Uh, you'd think twice about charging the electric toothbrush. Um, this is, uh, you know, in very simple terms, some of the things that government using a, a taxing policy could, uh, could do to restrict, the, you know, the use of energy. I really don't think, though, that would solve the problem. Yes? It's been conceived of, not, I don't think it's been, I know it hasn't even been, it hasn't been considered officially, but our Arab friends uh, have reminded us that this is a possibility. There have been articles in the Beirut press. Uh, they've said, don't try it before you can get here. We can blow it all up. Uh, whether if they blew it up, we could put, put it back together again fast enough, I don't know. I mean, uh, this, is a, this is a technical uh, question. Uh, as far as the Soviet... Well, that's, that's what I'm getting to next. The Soviet Union is not in the same bind that we are. And uh, they, uh, there was an article uh, in Time magazine a couple of months ago talking about the tremendous uh, reserves of crude oil just that have been untapped that's still laying out there in Siberia. So uh, whether the, I think it's quite uh, doubtful that the Soviet Union would want to get involved in such a, such a risky enterprise. And of course, the, the political consequences of, of such a deed would be would be horrendous. Uh, I mean, it's clearly, if one country is militarily the most powerful on, you know, Earth or two or three, uh, theoretically, you know, they have, a, they have the power to do such things. I just don't think that's in the cards. I've been asked that question before here uh, quite often, actually. Um, but I don't think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a policy alternative. Uh, the Europeans certainly couldn't sustain it. They don't have the wherewithal to do that. But it would mean we'd have to sit on, you know, uh, <coughs> countries out there. And I just, uh, and from a moral point of view, from the, the, the after Vietnam, support from the American people, I, uh, I just don't think it's in the cards. Yes? sure was. Um, there was a statement uh, later in the press where one of my colleagues, unnamed, said, uh, yeah, some idiot gave him this thing and, uh, you know, he didn't check quickly enough to read it. The situation that existed with Mossadegh and the Shah and everything in Iran was another era. That's all there is to it. Uh, it's not, uh, in my opinion, and I think, uh, 
I remember the statement. I can't, you know, uh, think of the the exact language. But uh, we're not uh, we're not talking, you know, about the early 50s. We're talking, you know, about today. That uh, statement was particularly unfortunate because uh, to people that know the background to the whole situation there, you also had a question of you know coup, counter coup, and manipulation, and it was a kind of a, a rather messy uh, situation. The fact. Uh, uh, the circumstances that existed in uh, at the time of the Mossadegh, the nationalization, uh, just simply don't exist today. That's ancient history. That's like saying we should do something today because the Romans in the first century did something. I just don't feel it's applicable. To what extent, uh, you know, this oil will you know will need to be will need to be bought. It will need to be bought. Depends on all these other factors. How much people are willing to pay for more expensive sources of energy. If they're not willing to pay, then they have to buy this oil. In what mixture they're going to buy the oil? Are they going to buy the oil? Um, are they going to if they if their if their needs are six million barrels a day of oil? Are they going to try and cut that down to two million? Or are they going to buy the whole six million? In abstract terms, without these these uh, political uh, and economic considerations of dependence and so forth. It's quite obvious. In any commercial transaction, you buy your goods where the price is the cheapest and the quality is the best. And where the price is the cheapest and the quality is the best is in the Persian Gulf. Now, there's these other factors that we have to grind in. And how they're going to be ground in, I just don't know. Yes? Your first question first. What do you mean a free hand? I believe I said fair and a more fair oh, hand. even handed, I even believe, handed. was the word. Yes, even. The states would be even handed. That's right. right. Yeah. Now, do you think that the United States have an even handed democracy? What, right now? Yes. Our policy in the Middle East? Oh, no. No, our policy in the Middle East is is clearly. I mean, um, we would hope, you know, to try for an even-handed policy, uh, but I uh, uh, we want to get along, you know, with both, you know, both people. But if you look in terms of concrete, uh, uh, for example, how many, how much military hardware has been sold to the Arabs? Uh, not the six billion that someone told me today in a question, uh, not by any means. Uh, I think they cranked in Israel and Iran and a few other things in, in this. It was an article out of a magazine. It's amazing how you get these pieces of misinformation. But no, clearly we, uh, uh, we are strongly, firmly committed to the support of Israel. And the support of Israel uh, runs absolutely counter to what the Arabs want in the Middle East. Uh, although we would like to get along with, uh, with the Arabs, uh, the support of Israel comes first. So that... Um, that for, certainly for the Arabs uh, creates, uh, you know, creates an imbalance. And uh, um, it would appear to me that uh, our, our policy in the Middle East uh, rests first upon our support of Israel and then has other considerations down the line. Now, your question about the Arab uh, with oil and political maturity and so forth, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the fact that uh, people want to use what their most valuable commodity is to achieve uh, their own aims is only, you know, is only realistic. 
a number of the uh, so-called uh, you know, surprising demands of the oil producing countries uh, are really quite understandable when you look at it from their point of view. Uh, let's take uh, the high cost of oil. People say, well, these oil producers, these, these OPEC countries, they're driving, they're driving the cost of oil up, making it so expensive in Europe and uh, in the United States. This is a question that the, uh, that the Iranians just absolutely love to chew on because, I believe as Prime Minister Hoveda said, if the price of oil is so expensive in West Germany and over, say, I don't know what their tax rate is, but let's say 50% or 30 or 20 or whatever it is of the price, the end price to the consumer of oil is taxes. One way you can reduce, if you're concerned about that, is to reduce uh, the taxes on oil that you in the West put on the oil. Someone says, well, then where are we going to raise the revenue? Well, the Arab and the, the Iranian said, that's not our concern. Where you in the United States or you in West Germany, you know, raise your revenue, all we're saying is that if you think the oil is too expensive, there are other ways other than asking us to reduce our price to reduce the end price of the oil. Or as the Iranian government would say, what in other words, this is the Iranian government speaking, you know, my Iranian friends will excuse me, uh, the Iranian government would say, and this would be echoed by, by, by the Arabs or the Venezuelans or the Indonesians, anyone in OPEC, saying, in essence, then, what you're asking us to do, us, Iran, with the, all these vast development problems, you know, no electricity in the villages, you're asking us to, to subsidize your economic development in the United States and Western Europe by providing you with cheap energy or providing you with energy at such a low rate that there's still plenty of room for you to tax it. So don't talk to us about the price of oil going up. Now, this to me, uh, whether it's uh, Hoveda or whether it's Saki Yamani uh, or whether it's, you know, in his day, Nadim Pachachi or Mana Oteba or whoever, this type of talk to me denotes a, a political uh, maturity. I think it's, uh, it's not at all unrealistic for these people to look after their own interests. Yes. Oh, I suppose, you know, it's like the other one, it's a possibility. Um, then we have to start to think, well, what, you know, what countries, you know, might move in and which ones, you know, might do it. Well, I guess, first of all, you start to think, you know, maybe the Egyptians might do it, but the Egyptians have got a bigger problem on their plate at the moment. Um, whether the Egyptians, and they, boy, this is, this is wild speculation, you know, that's like saying, you know, is there another solar system almost? Uh, whether the Egyptians would be allowed by the superpowers to do that is something else again. Whether you know the superpowers might move in to stop that type of thing. I would think it would be far more likely that a country like Egypt would seek to improve its relations with the governments, or the gov as it is doing, the government of Saudi Arabia, so that it gets a piece of this money. The government of Kuwait, for example, through the Kuwait Fund for Economic Development is already spending lots and lots of money in the poorer Arab countries. And of course, the poorer Arab countries uh, you know, may or may not be in a position to do this. I think this is speculation. I think that uh, it's more likely that the poor Arab, uh, the richer Arab countries will for lots of reasons, uh, reasons of self-interest as, uh, as well as reasons of charity, help out the poor Arab. They're already doing it. And whether they do it enough or not, or some, that's that's a whole, you know, that's a, but the, the principle is there. Yes? But what is it in Israel that makes the rest who are in the Middle East, let's just say Israel, or, not, or that we even consider or even consider, I mean, uh, consider adjusting the policy of the Middle East? What is it that inspires the United States or Israel so strongly? I think that. Um, to answer that question, you have to back off and look at how our government works. Uh, U.S. is a democratic society. We have a pluralistic society as well. And things get done in Washington depending on who pushes where. The government is responsive, as it should be in a democratic society, to what is expressed as the interests of the people. The 
interests that the government feels in Washington, in the Middle East, are to support the state of Israel. This comes primarily through citizens of the United States, Jewish religion and origin, who feel very strongly about this subject. There's nothing wrong with that. We have other minority groups, uh, other ethnic groups that feel strongly about other foreign countries. And they have put on, they have made that uh, interest felt to the politicians, to our political leadership in Washington. Not just, it's to a great extent uh, uh, people of Jewish religion who uh, by and large believe in the political doctrine of Zionism. It's also non-Jews. There are a number of non-Jews, of Christians in this, in this country that uh, firmly subscribe to the Zionist philosophy. There are also a number of people who don't know anything about the Middle East, but if you took a Gallup poll, would probably, I think, uh, be more pro-Israeli than pro-Arab. This is due, I think, to a question of informational media. So the government, in reacting to those pressures that it sees, has established a policy of supporting the state of Israel. You have to weigh, in other words, foreign considerations in formation of any foreign policy plus domestic considerations. Now the question that people start to ask is, you have a new element in the equation. What's going to happen when the United States needs the Arabs more and more because of oil? And that I really don't know. That's a question of when people, for example, in the United States start saying that they don't have enough heating oil, that's going to generate pressure on the government from one area to correct that situation. When people start to say that uh, a factory closes because it can't get lube oil, that's going to generate uh, pressure. Now that assumes that the energy crisis won't be solved some other way. If that pressure is sufficient to offset another pressure, I think you might, you know, might see a change. But uh, if you go out and say, you know, does Israel, does Israel have things that we vitally need that they, you know, that they sell to us? No. Our policy is based, I think, more on domestic political considerations than external political considerations. Uh, that's not unique for Israel. That's, that's happened elsewhere, too. Yes? I don't know if I followed the, the question that uh, let, 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 me, let me answer the question with a comment and if that hasn't answered your question, have another go at your question and I'll have another go at the comment. Although uh, the oil producing states do not necessarily border on Israel and are not necessarily in, uh, involved in a face-to-face -face confrontation with Israel, I think it would be a mistake to underestimate the feeling of all Arabs on this subject and the, and the commitment of all Arabs uh, toward this subject. It's, uh, it's very easy to say, well, the people in Dubai are a long, long way from Israel. Therefore, maybe they don't feel quite as strongly about that. We don't have to worry too much about them. It's my personal view that the question of Palestine, of the rights of the Palestinians, of Israeli occupation of, I'm talking from the Arab point of view, Ar Israeli occupation of Arab land, uh, Zionists would say it's, it's not, it's our land, uh, is, an, is, is, is really an issue. Uh, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, for example, does feel very, very strongly on this issue. And uh, whether now or, or not that issue would take precedence over economic considerations and uh, uh, King Faisal would wreck Saudi Arabia uh, for the sake of the Palestinians, uh, I doubt that. But I don't. Again, I don't think that's that's you know a consideration. Now, is that what you meant, or? I don't know. That's like saying, do you love your wife, or your son more? I just don't know. <laughs> I 
just don't know. Yeah. You mentioned that Iran is in the energy crisis. If this is the case, uh, is there large, are there large amounts of money, billions and millions of dollars being spent by the U.S. government on resources of energy, uh, also in Western Europe and in Japan? Or really is this a more of a publicity war uh, crisis than a, than a real one? No, I think the, the crisis exists. I think one indication that the crisis exists that we that if by that that our own domestic supplies certainly of crude oil are dropping is uh, the amount of money that American companies are investing in say Arab countries say in this in Saudi Arabia uh, knowing full well the risky nature of such investments after the haggling uh, on participation and after the problems the companies are having, say, in Libya. I mean, production hasn't sloughed off uh, in Saudi Arabia at all, and this nationalization in, Israel, uh, in uh, Libya was not at all, you know, a surprise to, uh, to, uh, to the oil companies. Uh, Gaddafi's position was quite, uh, you know, was quite clear on it. But if, uh, I've lost the, uh, I've lost the, uh, uh, the thread of your question. Um, no, it's been a long day. Oh, it's spending the money. Well, I think we have an energy crisis. The point is, if we, if if the companies are are spending that much money, if Aramco is spending the millions of dollars that it takes to raise production sixty percent over over one year, and they could spend that money down in Texas and Oklahoma without running the political, the economic risks that they're running, they do it. So I think it's quite clear that the companies have the oil in the Middle East or are looking for the oil in the Middle East, not in the United States. Uh, as to what the United States is spending in research in uh, uh, these other uh, forms of energy, uh, I really don't know. Uh, I suspect that uh, what is being spent uh, is, is, not, uh, is not sufficient, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about a crisis. Otherwise the people who, who know these figures, who watch these things, uh, wouldn't be uh, waving a red flag. I mean, that's the guess. I really don't know. To answer your question honestly, I don't know. Uh, yeah, over here. Yeah, it'll drop, but uh, they have the the North, uh, you know, the uh, the North Sea uh, coming on. But nevertheless, uh, fifty percent is is I can't see really the difference. Uh, when you're you're half dependent, uh, you're still so vitally dependent that uh, uh, it doesn't it doesn't make make a difference. Even Japan with forty one percent, if Japan should lose access to the Middle Eastern oil, it would be an economic catastrophe for Japan. And you find the Japanese everywhere today in the Persian Gulf trying to conclude deal and deal and deal. The biggest breakthrough on this new participation crude, that crude oil that came as a result of the Tehran agreements of, uh, I guess a couple of years ago now, in Abu Dhabi, the biggest price increase, one that everyone says is, oh, it's unrealistic, uh, why do they pay so much, was paid by the Japanese. Of course, it's turned out that the price that the Japanese paid a little while back that was so high is now so low that the government of Abu Dhabi wants to renegotiate the agreement. So um, I, uh, I don't think that the North Sea is going to really change the balance in Europe any more than the North Slope is going to change it here. Yeah, this is the way it goes, you know. Uh, the last question is, is asked as I roll up the window in the car and it starts, uh, it starts to roll. Uh, who, hasn't, uh, who hasn't had a question? Was over here? Yeah. Oh, you think whether the consumers would? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think that's that's just a natural uh, uh, development of of any economic you know any economic situation. Uh, 